Hello epistemologists, we're here for another session of epistemology class and today we'll be discussing the regress problem, which is a problem for how to account for justification. And we'll zoom in closely on two different responses to the regress problem. One of them is called foundationalism, which we've been discussing already quite a bit, um, and coherentism, which is a view we haven't yet quite explored. And I'll also talk about in a little bit in my lecture, what relationship these different views have to internalism and externalism. I'll also briefly touch on infinitism as a reply to the regress argument. And obviously I'll nod to the skeptic response. So the pieces I had you read for today are largely Michael Humer's Foundation and Coherence, but also there's this piece by Lawrence Bonjour uh, that's relevant, that was optional. And finally, a piece by Ernest Sosa called The Raft and the Pyramid. I find Sosa's piece quite helpful if you're making arguments in favor or against a particular view because it's very thorough and it's uh, very geometric in form. <laughs> it's very uh, proof formatted, so it's good to look back at it. Um, but for now, I've picked a different piece for you to focus on. All right, so we're gonna get started. I have to let you know, I spent a long time on this PowerPoint so this video might be a tad bit late, but um, I'm pretty happy with how the PowerPoint turned out. That said, it might mean that there's less other video edits that will go into this, so please be forgiving. Building on justification, foundations, and coherence. So one question to start this out is, have you ever uh, been in a class where they made you like build a bridge, or maybe build a tower, or maybe build a raft that you had to cross a small body of water in, and then there was a competition uh, about which students could get more weight on this raft or this tower without it collapsing. If you've ever done that, this is sort of what these epistemologists are trying to do in responding to the regress problem. They're trying to build a structure that's not gonna fall apart on them. And the structure is made out of bits of justification, bits of rational support among beliefs and among bits of knowledge. So. We're trying to build epistemological structure that won't fall apart and that will stay up longer than everybody else's. So that's our criteria for today. Let's see who succeeds. Let's first go over the regress problem. The regress problem, if you might recall from the end of last lecture, says, suppose I can claim to know some proposition P. For example, the proposition, there are turtles in the pond. We might ask you, how do you know P? How do you know there are turtles in the pond? And I answer, well, I have justification for believing that there are turtles in the pond. For example, I have perceptual evidence that there's turtles in the pond. And then the person asks you, how do you know that you have justification for believing that you have perceptual evidence that there are turtles in the pond? And then I say, well, I have evidence that my perception works and that's what makes me believe that I have perceptual evidence that there are turtles in the pond. And then someone asks you, well, how do you know that you have the justification to believe that you have evidence that your perception works and that that's a reason why you have perceptual evidence that there are turtles in the pond? And so on and so forth. It just goes on forever. So we've got turtles all the way down. So what are some responses to the regress problem? Here are four of them sketched out for you, and I've given each their own little symbol for easy recognition. So one response is foundationalism. Foundationalism says that we have foundational beliefs that justify our other beliefs. So at some point the regress stops because we get to a foundational belief and it's like, it's like a cornerstone of our building or the foundation of our building. It's, you're not gonna go further into the ground. It holds everything else up and we can rely on that, we can stop there. So the regress has a stopping point beyond which no further justification can be given. But according to the foundationalists, that's okay, because there's something special about the foundational beliefs that makes them foundational. We'll talk about this a bit more. Another response to the regress problem is the coherentist response. The coherentist says that our beliefs are justified by their coherence with each other, their agreement and mutual inferential support maybe of our empirical beliefs. So my empirical beliefs, the things that I experience fit together with the other things that I experience and they're mutually consistent and they're coherent and they, they support each other in the things that I believe. 
Now, infinitism as a response to the regress problem says that the justification chain actually does go on forever. It really is turtles all the way down. However, for the infinitist, that's not a problem. It's not so bad to have an infinite number of beliefs that each of your beliefs is relying on. It's a little bit different from the coherentist view, you might notice, because of course the infinite chain goes, goes down. So there might be beliefs that are not coherently supported by other beliefs as you go down the chain. And each belief that is more foundational, as it were, might not depend on other beliefs. So the justification chain just goes on forever. But the affinitist says, that's fine. I'm just always going to be able to give answers to the why question. At some point, those why questions will, will be difficult to answer. But as a matter of fact, I have an infinite chain of justification. So I'm fine. Skepticism is the response to the regress problem that says, nope, this is a real big, deep issue for justification. Beliefs actually can't be justified without a doubt. And so we don't know anything. We, don't, we shouldn't believe anything. We should just withhold belief about everything. Maybe the world's an illusion. My perception doesn't give me any evidence. Even inferences are not helpful. It's just, it's just all bad. So for the skeptic, it's just end game. Now, there are skeptics in, in philosophy. There are views, some of which we've discussed when we discussed skepticism earlier in the semester. So I won't say more about skepticism at this point because it's kind of a negative view. It's, it's a view that you can't solve this problem. So I'll focus primarily on the, the two most popular ways of sol solving the regress problem, which are the foundationalist and the coherentist ways of solving the regress problem. I'll just sort of acknowledge the infinitist. <laughs> if you're attracted to this view, it might be interesting to defend it. So I, I look forward to seeing what you have to say in favor of infinitism. So foundationalism. This is, I would say, probably the most popular response to the regress problem um, in philosophy, uh, at least given my very first person subjective evidence at this point. A lot of the philosophers I've met are foundationalists. And foundationalists say that we have foundational beliefs that justify our other beliefs. And you might notice that both Rene Descartes and G.E. Moore were foundationalists. Now, Descartes is an internalist foundationist, and Moore is an externalist foundationalist, but they both agree that there's sort of a foundational set of beliefs that help us build all of our other beliefs from them. So one problem that arises for any foundationalist view is that how much you include in the set of basic or foundational beliefs also affects the scope of what you can justify. So if you compare Descartes to Moore, Moore can very quickly justify more of his set of beliefs than Descartes because he includes more in the set of basic or foundational beliefs than Descartes does. Um, Descartes doesn't initially include his perceptual beliefs among his foundational beliefs, and so it means that it takes him longer to build up what he eventually feels is a justified belief in the world being as he sees it. Whereas Moore just starts with the assumption that that he's justified in believing his perceptual evidence. So what that tells us is a couple things. One, that foundationalism seems rickety as a response to the regress problem because there's so much variation in what you can say you're justified in believing, which seems like an issue. Secondly, I guess, is that it seems arbitrary what it is that you're justified in if this is your response to the regress problem. So this will require further definition. We will need to stipulate a bit more. The foundationalists have to debate among themselves who has the better account of justification. And we've seen some of that already with the debate between the evidentialists who are internalists and the reliabilists who are externalists. Both of those are foundationalists. Here's a second problem for foundationalism. Given that the basic beliefs in many cases could be false, that is, that they are contingent, and that seems right. Um, if you're a reliableist, right, many of your beliefs could have been false. Even if you're Descartes, many of your beliefs could have been false. So many of your basic beliefs are contingent. What is our rational basis for thinking that the more basic beliefs are themselves more likely true in the actual world than false? So here are a couple of responses to the likelihood problem. The internalist Cartesians can say, well, Here's a reason for thinking that the basic beliefs are more likely true in the actual world than false, because the basic beliefs are 
self-justified or they're self-evident. You remember when we talked about those things. One problem for this response is that it works for a priori necessary beliefs. So things that I have justification for as a result of doing inference from the armchair, if you like, as opposed to looking out into the world. But this justification for the likelihood of my basic beliefs doesn't work for contingent beliefs, which is what we were after initially. Contingent beliefs like there is a computer in front of me right now, that could have been false. It's not a priori necessary. So saying that it's self-evident doesn't work for contingent beliefs. So here's the, the response to the likelihood problem from more of an externalist perspective, which is to say that maybe you have direct apprehension of, or direct acquaintance of the things that are your basic beliefs. A problem with this response is that if perception has assertoric force, so if perception is telling me things like, there is a computer here, that's an assertion, right? If my perception has a assertoric force, then the opponent here to the foundationalist thinks it also needs rational grounds. On what basis does my perception get to assert that there is a computer here? It needs additional justification. Let's suppose that we think that perception doesn't have assertoric force. Maybe it has no content at all, but if it has no content, then how would it provide epistemic support in the first place? If it's not saying anything, then how is it supporting anything? What do you think? How would you respond to this problem for foundationalism? Is there a solution? If there's not a solution, is that a problem? That's maybe an additional question we can ask. Is this something that the foundationalist should genuinely worry about? Now, here's uh, further issues for specifically a reliableist kind of foundationalism. It has to do with this second response to the problem of likelihood. Is this still properly a view about rational support? If you think perception just gives you support in virtue of the connection that you have with the world, but not in virtue of the content that perception provides to you, like the assertoric declaration of this is a computer in front of me, then how is it still properly a view about rational support? How is a person justified if they're not expected to have access to their justification? Here are some objections, right? Some versions of this objection. External reliability is not necessary for epistemic justification. What does this mean? It means, according to some people, the problem is that we don't need reliable belief forming processes in order to have epistemic justification. The internalist will think, actually what is necessary is my access to information and sometimes I won't have a reliable process connecting me. I won't have well-foundedness, but I'll still have epistemic justification. So that means that you don't need external reliability at all. Some reliabilists agree about this. There's a kind of mixed kind of reliabilist that says, yeah, 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 it's not necessary for epistemic justification, but if you have reliability, it's sufficient for justification and that's good enough for us. But here's a second kind of objection that says, no, external reliability is actually not sufficient for epistemic justification after all. We think that it might be the case that you have a reliable process that helped you form your belief, but your belief doesn't have justification. Like maybe think of the clairvoyant case. The beliefs that the clairvoyant has cannot both be rational to act on and rational to hold, the opponent says here. So it might be rational for the clairvoyant to act, like, you know, if I pretend it's not true and bad things happen, I might have pragmatic reasons to act on the belief. But that doesn't necessarily mean that I have good epistemic reasons to have the belief. So the clairvoyant might be said to be rational to act as if they believe that what they've asserted is true, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they have good reason for holding on to the belief. So one response to this clairvoyant case is something called qualified externalism. And the qualified externalist says that the clairvoyant is justified as long as they don't have defeating evidence against the truth of their visions. So the idea is, all right, the clairvoyant would fail to have justification if the clairvoyant had reasons that showed them they weren't justified in believing what might happen tomorrow. But if they don't have such reasons, then they're fine. So as long as they don't have defeaters, they're good. 
If no defeating evidence is present, then the reliability of the belief forming process is still sufficient for epistemic justification, according to the qualified externalist. So you get a kind of partial externalism, because notice that the defeating ex evidence would have to be internally accessible. Now, Lawrence Bonjour at this point uh, snarks something like the following. The problem is that the clairvoyant, even with no defeating evidence, still doesn't seem epistemically justified. So Bonjour just doesn't like the clairvoyant case as an example of someone with justification. He thinks it's all suspicious. Furthermore, are there reasons, he asks, for partial internalism that are not also reasons for full internalism? Why go halfway? Like if you're going halfway, isn't that a reason to go the entire way with internalism? Why would partial externalism be a better view than just full on internalism? It feels like you're relying on internalist principles. So you might as well just admit that you're an internalist. Okay, so the next view we'll talk about, this is basically where we're gonna pause with foundationalism. We'll come back to foundationalism in a minute um, and talk about the Michael Hilmer's response to the regress problem. But next, I want to talk about coherentism. Coherentism is the view that coherence by itself can provide justification for belief. And I'll note here that coherentism is usually thought to be an internalist view only. I've heard people say that you couldn't have an externalist coherentism, and there are people with arguments for this, um, including in a book by by Bonjour and Sosa, they, they discuss this issue very briefly. So I'll, I'll just table that issue for now. Just assume that coherentism, as I'm talking about it, is an internalist view. Now, how do I know that a system of beliefs coheres? Well, it coheres when it's, first of all, consistent. Uh, they don't contradict each other. Second of all, when the beliefs are mutually supporting, many of the beliefs in the system are mutually supporting. So one suggests the other and tails the other. And finally, when there are no anomalies in that system of belief, that's when it's coherent. So there aren't any weird left out oddball beliefs that don't fit well with the other beliefs. And so that's when you'll have like a nice network if it's consistent, mutually supporting, and there aren't any weirdo anomalies. Here's a probabilistic argument in favor of coherentism, which is that the best explanation for your beliefs being coherent is that your beliefs are true. Truths in the world, if there are such truths, presumably cohere, right? Um, they're consistent, they're mutually supporting, and there wouldn't be any anomalies. The, the external world, we assume, is, is consistent with itself. If there were contradictions in the way that the world was, presumably the world would stop being a thing. <laughs> if you had inconsistencies in the world, it would cancel itself out, you might imagine, and then we wouldn't exist. So we wouldn't be here to ask that question. So the idea is if your beliefs also cohere with each other, then there's a sense in which they, they're similar to the way that truths relate to each other. And so that means that coherence is a good marker for truth. They're more likely to be true. So what that means is that they would give me justification if I know that my beliefs are coherent with each other. That would give me justification for believing that they're true and probably true together. So now what are some problems for coherentism? There's many, so we won't have time to talk about all of them, but I'm just going to list them for you and then I'll pick a couple to talk about in more detail. One problem with coherentism is that it requires that each belief has independent credibility and that might be hard to come by. How can you get independent reasons for believing every single particular belief or as many of them as possible in your belief set? That's sort of like a steeper commitment than foundationalism, right? Foundationalism just needs uh, that a couple of foundational beliefs have very strong independent credibility. Coherentism might need that like the independent credibility of each belief is like slightly easier to come by, but it's still a lot when you think about all of your beliefs needing something like this. Second, Coherentism requires pre-existent knowledge to show that coherence increases the probability of truth. In order to use coherentism as a view, you kind of have to already know some stuff maybe about how epistemology works <laughs> or why it makes sense to believe that a coherent system of beliefs provides justification because it makes your beliefs more likely to be true. 
And that's kind of sophisticated. And that will leave out a couple of kinds of knowers that you might imagine have knowledge. So that, that might be a problem. Thirdly, there's a problem in that coherence seems to provide no role for experiences independent of belief in justification. So you get beliefs that justify other beliefs, but then what do experiences that are not beliefs do in the theory? Humor says it's counterintuitive. An individual with exactly the same beliefs as I have, but entirely different sensory experiences would be irrational, <laughs> right? You could have a coherent system of beliefs, but if your perceptual experiences don't back them up, coherentism might still say that you're rational as long as they're, the beliefs are coherent in exactly the same way as someone who, whose beliefs do fit their perception. So I'll just side note here, some of this might be resolved by a good account of what evidence is and what the relationship is between experiences and beliefs. So that might be less serious. I think if you have a good theory about the relationship between experiences and beliefs, you might not have this issue. Fourth problem with coherentism. Many coherent sets of propositions exist, but we don't have reason to accept all of them. And just as a compelling example, consider conspiracy theories. There are lots of people, and we talked about this briefly in class, who believe coherent sets of things, such as a conspiracy theory, where many of the bits of evidence they have, the beliefs they have about the evidence, fit together pretty well, but where that coherent set of propositions feels off, right? That's why we call them conspiracy theories, because they're not completely implausible, and they're helped along by their internal coherence, but they're just implausible enough that we think that getting into that coherent circle of beliefs is bad. And so people should recognize that before they adopt this coherent but kind of wacky belief set. It's not great to be a conspiracy theorist. Fifth problem with coherentism, which we'll unpack in more detail in a minute, how do we define coherence? I've given already, right, some, some reasons why beliefs are counted as coherent, but that's not a definition of coherence. So we need to still define coherentism. And we will do that in a minute. Just give me a second. Sixth problem with coherentism is circularity. Coherence theory seems to endorse circular reasoning. This is the accusation. We'll look at some responses to this accusation in a minute. So let's first talk about how to define coherence, because that seems important. Now, humor is going to find both of these definitions lacking, but maybe you can think of some reasons to defend them. So one definition of coherence is logical consistency. Your beliefs are coherent if they're not logically inconsistent. Humor says this is too strong. That's surprising because this is supposed to be the weak definition of coherence. It's too strong, according to humor, because it is possible to be justified in believing in an inconsistent set of propositions. For example, and this will require an aside, the lottery problem or the preface paradox. So what are the lottery problem and the preface paradox? Let me tell you, both intended to show how a person who rationally believes particular propositions might kind of accidentally be irrational when you sort of zoom out and look at their total belief set. I'll start with the preface paradox. The preface paradox is like, Suppose that you are a professor and you're writing a textbook and it's very common for people writing textbooks to write in their prefaces. It is my belief that the majority of this work is correct. Um, and I have tried the best of my ability to make sure that only true things are said in this book. However, there might be mistakes. And if there are mistakes, uh, you should blame me for the mistakes. So this is someone who maybe because they know how hard it is to put together a textbook and because they're sufficiently humble, believes of each proposition in the textbook, it has some probability of being true, but the probability of it being true is not one. They're not guaranteed to be true. Nonetheless, they think that when you look at all the propositions in the book, the likelihood of all of the propositions in the book being true is pretty good on their view, right? Because otherwise they wouldn't have written a textbook. They wouldn't be a very good expert. However, if you think about like the hundreds of hundreds of propositions that are made in any one textbook, the probability that all of them are true, given that each one of them has some likelihood of being false, 
is vanishingly small. So you get, you get a paradox here. How is it possible for the person to be rational in believing that for any one single belief and each and every single belief, they have some probability of being false, but who also has the belief that the total amount of beliefs have a high probability of being true? Anyway, that's the, that's the preface paradox. Here's the lottery paradox. The lottery paradox says that you're justified in believing for a, a fair lottery with a thousand tickets. You're justified in believing, well, someone, one of these thousand people will win the lottery, right? But you're also justified in believing for each individual ticket that that ticket is very unlikely to win the lottery, right? So for ticket number one, probably not gonna win the lottery. And that's what you believe. For ticket number two, probably not gonna win the lottery. And that's what you believe and so on and so forth. For all of the tickets, one through a thousand, <laughs> but yet you think someone is gonna win. You think someone is gonna win the lottery, not no one is gonna win the lottery. These beliefs seem incoherent, right? So your conjunction of all of the beliefs that you have about each individual ticket, that each individual ticket is very unlikely to win, that is, it actually is more likely that it'll lose, that conjunction also supports a belief that no one will win. But that flies in the face of your belief that someone will win. So how do you make sense of that? That's kind of a problem in epistemology. So getting back to coherence now, logical consistency as a requirement on coherence is a problem because it's possible to be justified in believing an inconsistent set of propositions. And this is what happens in the lottery problem and the preface paradox. So humor is basically saying, if you go with logical consistency, you can't respond to the lottery problem or the preface paradox. You just get yourself in trouble. Here's another possible definition of coherence. It's mutual entailment. And humor says that if beliefs mutually entail each other, that's not enough for coherence because it's too weak. It's too easy to start from any set of propositions and then add further propositions to the set in such a way that every member of the set is entailed by the rest of the set. For example, suppose that I just start with beliefs A, B, and C. It's so easy to only add beliefs that are entailments from the conjunction of A and B, or the conjunction of B and C, or the conjunction of A and B and C, and so on and so forth, and make sure that I'm only ever coherent in my belief set. But that won't work to account for what my actual belief set looks like, because I can't end up with any beliefs that are outside of my initial set. <laughs> so that makes this mutual entailment version not work as a definition of coherence. So it feels like we have a problem. Here's a response though by the coherentist. You can modify it so that it's only coherence among independently acquired beliefs that is okay. You define coherence in a way that makes it be that beliefs cohere when those beliefs are independently acquired and then you define coherence and then you'll get a principle hopefully that's not too weak or too strong when you apply it to coherence All right so here's the sixth problem that we discussed for coherence that i will discuss in a little bit more detail which is the objection that coherentism endorses circular reasoning that seems really serious right it would be bad <laughs> if Coherentism makes it okay to be circular in your reasoning. The response is to say that you can distinguish linear coherentism from holistic coherentism. Linear coherentism is one that takes you from one belief to endorse another belief, to endorse maybe the first belief again. That looks very like a small circle. Whereas if you went with holistic coherentism, one where you get one belief endorsing many other beliefs, which then endorse many other beliefs, which then endorse many other beliefs. And eventually you get that first belief back in that system that looks more holistic and not circular. The holistic version avoids the circularity objection better. One response to that response is to ask why we should accept that the size of the circle affects how much we are happy with this type of reasoning, right? The difference here is just that the linear coherentism gives you a smaller circle before you get back to your original belief. And the holistic coherentist view 
gets you a bigger circle. But why should the size of the circle affect the circularity of the reasoning? Now, one thing to note in response on behalf of the coherentist is just that foundationalism ultimately also can be a little bit circular, right? Your basic beliefs are justified by nothing else. And so that means that in the end, all of the beliefs above that, <laughs> you know, don't totally get away from circularity, I guess, is what you could say. The distance between the belief in itself is not very far away in foundationalism. Okay, so what are some reasons for coherentism besides the regress argument? Besides the fact that um, coherence resembles the way that truths in the world are related. Coherentism allows you to say that there are multiple reasons why a belief is justified. You'll never be without a reason to give for why any one particular belief is justified. You won't get the basic belief problem where you ask, why are you justified in believing that and have nothing to say. The coherentist just thinks you keep answering and eventually you'll loop back to your original belief as a source of justification, maybe. In some instances, that's just how it's gonna work. But at least there will always be some feature that makes that belief justified. We don't they don't get into this conundrum that Moore had with responding to skepticism. The foundationalists reply, non-inferentially justified beliefs, the foundational beliefs don't need reasons to have justification. But that doesn't preclude that maybe you could find some reasons. So foundational beliefs give you justification, no further questions needed, but that doesn't mean that you couldn't answer for each foundational belief why it's justified if you investigate some more. It's just that you don't need that response that happens when you investigate some more. On their view, it's fine if you find it out after the fact, that won't undermine your justification initially. The coherentist responds, this still seems to defeat the point of foundationalism. If you could give a justification for your justification, even if it was supposed to be basic, then is it really basic? Are you really a foundationalist or are you secretly a coherentist? Humor responds, non-ideally self-aware agents can still have justified beliefs, right? Like squirrels and small children and people with cognitive def deficits, they could still have justified beliefs. And having reasons for their justified beliefs doesn't render non-inferential justification useless. So there's still a role here for inferential and non-inferential justification. We can all be friends and we can still have foundationalism, says humor. Again, the coherentist might just be like, well, okay, so maybe small children are like not self-aware about why their justified beliefs are justified, but what matters is that they do actually have a further justification, right? Okay. Foundationalism returns. So suppose that you weren't happy with coherentism and you wanna go back and talk about foundationalism again. So humor is here to sell you his version of foundationalism. And one thing we haven't talked about yet very much and humor has a view on is the, an answer to the question, which beliefs are foundational according to foundationalism? Five sorts according to humor. First of all, the infallible ones the ones you can't be wrong about, kind of like the ones that Descartes likes. Secondly, the ones when you are acquainted with the fact that makes it true. Also the Cartesian beliefs, but maybe this is more is included here. You're just acquainted with your, with your hand. So you're acquainted with the fact that makes it true that I believe that I have a hand that that's a true proposition. The ones formed because of a reliable process this is the reliablest view. Your foundational beliefs are the ones that are formed because of a reliable process. Fourthly, whichever beliefs you have are prima facie justified and you can keep them as long as you are not debunked, right? So maybe the clairvoyant has such beliefs. Maybe they have prima facie justified beliefs that they can keep as long as they don't have defeating reasons against them. If someone comes up and tells them, you know, your apparent clairvoyancy is just a result of a really good machine uh, injecting beliefs in you from a distance with a laser or something, and it's just broken down. Oh man, that defeats my justification for believing whatever I thought was gonna happen tomorrow. Fifth reason, fifth kind of beliefs that are foundational according to foundationalism. Whenever something appears to be the case, you are prima facie allowed to believe that it is. 
Now this fifth one looks a little bit unfamiliar. If it appears to be the case, you are justified in believing that it is the case. This is what Humer thinks. And actually this fifth kind of foundational beliefs fit really well with his phenomenal conservatist view. Phenomenal conservatism says that whenever something appears to be the case, not as a result of reasoning, that is non-inferentially, one has at least some degree of prima facie justification for believing it. This is Humer's view of justification. It's a foundationalist, internalist view. Why accept phenomenal conservatism? On his view, for a belief to be justified, the factor in virtue of which the believer has justification must itself be the reason why the believer accepts the proposition. So the reason why we believe all or most of the things we in fact believe is that they seem to us to be the case. Humor is just building this into his theory of justification. If it seems to you to be the case, then that's the reason why you believe it. And so that's the foundation of your beliefs, that the things that seem to you to be true are the ones that are uh, giving you justification for believing everything else. Now, you might ask several questions here. How good of a response is this? What doesn't work about it? What do you not like about it? All right, folks, so basically we've gone over foundationalism, coherentism, another version of foundationalism, and we've also sort of quickly discussed some problems and responses to the problems from each side. Um, in class, I would like to discuss a bit more the coherentist view that we've been given to work with, what you think about it, and see if we can't maybe make internalism sound a little bit attractive. Maybe we can, maybe the externalist way is the way to go. And you might have already seen that if you're an externalist, foundationalism is the only game in town, as far as we know. Unless you can come up with an externalist coherentism. Do you think you can do that? Why do you think you can't? Something to think about. All right, thank you so much for joining me today. I will see you next time. Bye.